and we will go through the exercise. So, hi, welcome to the Goal 7 call. And our topic today on sustainable work is um, what does sustainable work look like? Because some of us have a notion and some of us are doing it. So, um, so I will add the subject here. And we already did a, um, a popcorn question just very recently. So let me come up with a, um, another popcorn question. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm sitting here between calls and I'm thinking about um, snack foods because I'm hungry and didn't get a chance to eat lunch. So um, this seems like one of Andy's favorite questions. Um, so I want you to be very specific. If there is a, um, a name, like a, a brand or a flavor or something, um, what is your current favorite snack food? So I will tell you what I've been munching on. Trader Joe's makes these rice mochi nuggets um they're horrible horrible in that they're addicting and you can't just eat one but the really annoying part is they get stuck in your teeth so there's always like getting that because they gunk up but um but it's addicting and there's uh 150 calories and no sugar so not healthy but ish so anyway that is my current snack food of choice. Beth? Yeah. Well, I'm constantly on the uh, keto or, or uh, no carb thing, except for over the holidays, so I'm back in the big swing. And my new addiction is a chicken wing flavor called Frank Sriracha. <laughs> so they have a sweet chili and a, and a spicy sauce on them. And of course, I order only the flats. <laughs> So I'll go to Chad. Hi, Norris. Cool. Thanks, Beth. Um, so uh, just for the sake of the call, Chad Renondo, startup status. The um, uh, And snack food. And Cecilia, was there something besides snack food, or are we going straight into the snack food? Just flavor, right? Cool. Yeah. So um, look, I'm on a health food thing. It is still uh, New Year's enough to be a resolution. So uh, my go-to is carrots at the moment. Uh, um, I'm chowing down on the carrots. Um, so, Norris, what's what's your snack food here for the popcorn? You're on mute, mate. Hey, get off mute. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm unmuting you. Don't touch anything. No. Okay. No, it's not working. Mm, okay, there you go, Norris. So healthy snack or no? Unhealthy? No, just snack, just snack. Uh, I'm 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 pretty I, I, promiscuous in that regard. That's like if uh, I'm on a seafood diet, if I see it, I will try to eat it. Um, but uh, to be honest. Chocolate chip cookies. I can limit myself the one that 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 just always lifts my spirits. So who who else? Who do I? I, I finally got on. So who has not spoken? Um, Hassan. Hassan. Hassan, your your snack. I hope you can answer what it is, more skillfully than I did. <laughs> what is your What is your snack food of choice, Hassan? Um, chocolate. Chocolate. Anything chocolate. Okay, I have to. I have to tell on Hassan. Uh, Hassan and I uh, were in North Carolina together last week, and um, and we enabled each other to buy a big thing of chocolate um, with sea salt. So nice. Um, we we definitely enabled each other <laughs> to do that. Um, yes, and I've seen firsthand. It's dark chocolate with sea salt. All right, so thank you for joining us on the call. So the subject of today's call is sustainable work. What does it look like? What are the challenges um, to bringing it to fruition and what needs to happen to change that? So, so I think um, 
all of us in being happy to try to find work as ecosystem builders. What does sustainable work for an ecosystem builder look like? I'm just gonna kind of open it up to um, Beth, you created a an whole organization. Yeah, well, I think sustainable work looks like, and um, it's an important position or profession within the realms of economic development across the regions of the world. And um, the way I see that is, you know, if you have a, a economic development gateway in your region and a the focus on business retention and expansion, the focus on entrepreneurial development and encouraging organic growth. Having those two um, activities thrive in your community is what's going to be attractive to businesses that typical economic developers are looking to attract into a region. And entrepreneurs to attract them to come into our region because it's such a great place to start. If we're not integrated into that focus area for region's prosperity, I don't know, I have not seen how else it could potentially work, though I'm sure there are other ways. It just, I've not seen it and would love to hear it. That, that's a that's a great point, Beth, and it's something that we're seeing um, that I've really observed when, like, when the ecosystem building came out, you know, innovation hubs, startups, it, it was you know everybody doing startups for startups' sake, and we have seen this evolution into just core economic development principles and the cross section of economic development and community development, and just very pragmatically um, being able to tap into both budgets, <clears throat> but then also being able to position it. It is a niche. So you have major economic development, investment attraction, large corporates. Like that's just a machine that's been going for decades. But what we do is, is a bit of a specialist type function that quite often those entities don't have the capabilities or skills for. And so then where I've seen some really successful is they're able to position that as a niche outsourced service for traditional economic development bodies in order to get that long-term core funding. Um, and really, as we talk about sustainability, that's one of the keys is how do we, like any not-for-profit would face, how do you, how do you avoid the, the program by program, project by project cycle, which is a constant finding the grant, finding the biz dev, adapting your services so you can meet that specific criteria, then spending all your resources on delivering the program, which is quite often under-resourced, but then as the funding runs out, scrambling to try and get the next one as compared to what we hear a lot of these, like maybe the more backbone organizations getting that two, three year core funding. Um, and so that, that is one of the challenges is how do, we, how do we position this in a way that attracts the core funding while also then supplementing maybe by some one-off project by project work. I'd be interested in thoughts on that. Yeah, and I think you're right about the collective impact model. That's the that's the piece that I, I was talking about was that collective impact backbone support model needs to be sustained so that we can go for funding for those one-off projects and programs collectively as an ecosystem, right? So I, I, I think there's a, a little bit of the conversation that we've had recently um, around um, ecosystem building to economic development people. Um, What's phase phrase us on? Ecosystem building is woo woo. Uh, so the idea, hi Katie, the idea that um, that the challenges, um, and I think to your point, Beth, when we talk about what is sustainable work for ecosystem building, you have to integrate economic development because economic development is a tried and true course that people recognize and so if you don't have some interaction with with economic development and be able to show so we'll ask norris about the showing the numbers if you don't show that part that they're used to seeing then you're woo woo you're like this soft skills 
squishy thing that's a nice to have, but but I don't think that you show the value proposition of an ecosystem builder or whatever. It's it's a lot more about soft skills, right? Listening, connecting, those things that are <clears throat> nice. But um, so how do you quantify? So uh, Norris, you do a lot of uh, data and development around this stuff. And, and what are you seeing? Well, one of the things that uh, I'm increasingly hearing is that the economic developers uh, community's response to this, is, oh, this is what we've been doing all along that i and i don't think it's there's some degree of threat that you know that they see the this whole entrepreneurship development as something uh that's another com strong competitor for very scarce resources and a lot of them if they believe they've already there's a lot of and this a lot of dunning kruger in 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 this if you're familiar yeah, I, have you, and everyone familiar with the dunning kruger phenomenon uh, not this He's Bill Kruger is a very nice Canadian guy, but it's a, that novices tend versus experts. Novices tend to overestimate their uh, ability and performance. They really, it's easy for them to believe they're doing well enough. In fact, they may even be doing very, very well. And so it's very dis, it's a lot of cognitive dissonance and being hit with, uh, here's a better way of, of doing it. And in fact, a, a way that they is kind of alien to what, what they're doing. And so the logical response is, well, actually we have been doing this. You just put another, put old, put old wine into a new bottle. That, uh, that, uh, that figuring out the, uh, uh, the value add it, that what is it that we're bringing, uh, that is different, that is not replicable and expands the pie, uh, uh for resources. Uh, it's very su successful. I look at, you know, sometimes enviously, uh, permission to speak freely. Don't, to, don't tell this to the folks in Boise, but our chamber is enormous, powerful, well financed and doesn't get anything done, <laughs> but they have been able to position themselves as providing services, providing value. It may not be what you and I might like, but, People are uh, sponsors are willing to to fund them on often lavishly. They can get public money. At it's, uh, it's figuring it out. We have a, a fast fastest growing entity in the state is our Hispanic chamber, and they are just killing it. They are just brilliant. They don't. It costs a lot less than the regular chamber dues, and but they are figuring out where can out of the gate. What are the what value can we provide, including fee for service? That, uh, that one of the, and the, sort of the segue here is that one area where uh, there's both external money and potentially sponsorship money is uh, is providing this evidence that the whether it's the metrics, who runs the dashboard, the entrepreneurship, the economic development dashboard in your community, assuming you have one, uh, that actually works. Uh, who is operating the one I I, I am envious. And he teases me regularly. There's a guy up in Montana who runs basically once a week. He has a digest of all the cool things that are happening, the events coming up, interesting policy issues. And he spends three or four hours a week on it and bills 50, 60 K. Beth, could you use an extra 50, 60 K? Yeah, dang. So, Katie, so, let me anyway, but, but, I mean, but the idea is, is but the, in terms of the getting the metrics, the, the short answer is, is be, it's got to be credible. Having powerful numbers is not enough. We need to change the narrative. Uh, but it's, it's certainly, it, it's, a, it's a start. But having credible numbers, having a credible model, where do, what do these numbers really, really mean? That, for instance, Idaho, one metric shows that since 2010, we have just totally kicked ass in terms of entrepreneurship and tech and growth companies on an absolute basis. But on a relative basis, we're 42nd in the states, which is the relevant number depends on what the argument people are, and the, you know, then which narrative drives the argument. And I think that there's a, it may not be monetizable, but that there's a value add of, is explaining, not just providing the numbers, but explaining what they mean you know what what don't they mean and and you know i think what we're trying to do here is dial into the the media 
and the Idaho Business Review is going to start running some uh, stuff on on the, around the issue of metrics and gloriously we're probably going to cruising into a fist fight very soon which will be marvelous for getting stuff front and center but okay. ultimately says so for me sustainability is getting lot of, people paid so there's a lot of nuggets that you put in there Norris so I'm going to invite you and everyone else to kind of capture a lot of that high okay. high level stuff yes. and then Katie go ahead so what the last time I mean I think when we one of the things that impressed me about this whole sustainable work issue when um when I was in, was in 2018 was we it was all about having ecosystem building be recognized as a profession and um, we, I think we're at the place where other mm -hmm. professions have been. There was a time when marketing and sales were confused and marketing was not considered a profession. Um, in fact, they even called sales reps marketing reps. And so it took some time on the part of the people who were doing marketing to define what a marketing professional is. Now you can have certified marketing professionals. Let's go back to social media. There was a time when social media was not recognized as a profession. Now you have social media certification, social media <laughs> managers, vice presidents of social media. So I think it's <coughs> us to define what an ecosystem builder is, especially, I think one of the things that trips us up is uh, we're being so broad, instead of saying what we're talking about is an entrepreneurial ecosystem builder, specifically. And what does that person do and what does that job look like? Now we're not competing with the, the um, traditional economic developers, we're giving those economic developers another career path and another person they can add to their team. Um, so that's happening in two of, of the towns here, one more deliberately than the other, where the director of economic development recognized that she needed a, someone who focused specifically on the entrepreneurial community, the itty bitties of people just starting up. And she just added another person to her team to focus specifically on that. So you know, I think we need to cre create, make people understand <coughs> a set of skills and that this is a job that becomes part of the economic development team. So I know, um, uh, thanks Chad for putting that stuff in there and Katie, I, I think those are, are really relevant um, in, in talking about the profession, right? So the story that I usually share is like, so 10 years ago, there wasn't such a thing as project management, and now there's accreditation, certification, training, a career path. So Hassan and I had a conversation um, beginning of December when I was talking to all the eShip champions and saying, so what is it that you wanna do? And he said, I wanna be a full-time ecosystem builder, and now you are, a full-time ecosystem builder. Not that you weren't an ecosystem builder before, but what did they consider you as, Hassan, that you weren't deemed, like, I know what you were doing in Detroit was ecosystem building, but what were the other titles that they gave you, or what, what did they, uh, like, so, so talk about that. Well, my my title where I was at, I was a uh, regional director and my responsibility, my role and my responsibilities were primarily um, managing a portfolio of partnerships, um, looking for opportunities to collaborate. And that was like, the, that's like, if I were to pull out my job description, that's what it was described as managing a portfolio of partnerships across the region um, with an emphasis on initiatives in the city of Detroit. Um, a lot of the stuff that I was doing that like you could put under the heading of ecosystem building, I was doing primarily on my own time and because I saw value in it. But if I were to take all of that ecosystem building stuff and present it as ecosystem building, um, I don't think people would have seen value in it if it wasn't under a different heading and directly tied to some sort of business development. So that's a challenge. Will you put what you wrote into the, the agenda notes just so we can capture some of the high level um, stuff that we're talking about? So, so, um, so because I, I'm familiar with most of your backgrounds, um, Beth, 
I know that that um, you know you you work really hard to create this this universal um, support system and and to get that message out there and you had buy-in and then the challenges that happened um, around when leadership changes and things because there's a disconnect, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what is it that they didn't get when you showed that there was a pathway of success? Because I think that at the end of the day, a community is looking for success. And then to Norris's point, it's what they're measuring as success, which didn't seem to translate for the traditional economic development person. So where are we, where are we missing the mark? Like Chad was saying, engage and share and tell the story. But what is it that they're not hearing? Or what do we have to change in the story? Because if we don't change the narrative, we don't change, we can't necessarily change the people who are driving the dashboard to Norris's point, but there, something has to resonate or we will keep not engaging. Yeah, and you know, there are so many different hows and whys I think these things come across the finish line or don't. And I don't know how much most of you know, but um, we got, we've, we've had significant impact in, in, in being a catalyst for culture change. And there's entrepreneurship is at the top of every, every community leader's mind that they talk about it all the time. There are several programs popping up all over the place here around entrepreneurship, but there's no rhyme or reason to it. And, you know, so the impact that we've been able to have is the culture shift, the impact that we've not been able to have, which gets us across the finish line is that collective impact model where we understand why we're doing what we're doing and it's affecting the entrepreneurs so that they can be much more successful a lot faster so that ultimately our community is much more economically viable. So, for in our instance, we got new leadership and some key positions that came on board midstream. It's egos, it's personalities, it's who gets credit, it's all that old junk. And I think it's, it's all about leadership and somehow figuring out how to make it their idea um, or make them not feel threatened that their their world is going to change significantly or they're not going to be as, as, as prestigious as they were. And, and again, abundance versus scarcity mentality. It's just all of that mixed into one cloudy mud puddle. So like, um, where is Kelly Fitzgerald, Virginia? Their community is bought in. There are other communities like Southeast Michigan that are bought in. How do we how do we model those behaviors elsewhere? Can is it do we? I, at some point there will be enough of them that we you know looking at across the case studies we can we can see some some commonalities. Uh, the one thing I wanted to inject earlier is that most communities do not really have uh, a serious uh, a dashboard that they I was looking at one the other day they had this beautiful uh, dashboard that hasn't been updated since 2015 probably those numbers aren't <laughs> if their numbers are still the same that's uh, that, that's scary in itself but I think that's an opportunity to you know, to provide value figuring out what those right things are and you know when, while you were talking about that I was thinking I had a chat with Annika last week and her her latest blog post was talking about what if we could get everybody in the same you know the same room and talk about you know try to figure out who does 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 what and it's a, what I got from her is a lot of communities have had that conversation but it's they've never actually been able to do it uh, successfully because uh, it, it gets all Game of Thrones pretty pretty quickly but again I think something came up in the last call uh you know the peter block comment that that really hit me is that you know the the core leadership function of convening now it's possible to monetize that a little bit uh but you know who is going to be the 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 neutral turf the 
the fair broker that can get people at the, the table, uh, that is something that, you know, sponsors, uh, I think, can be, um, could be lured in because sustainability is, a, is simply how, you know, it's having a reasonably stable stream of income and a, and a reasonably stable, uh, you know, in, in terms of reputational capital. And that's something that, you know, it's 10 years to be an overnight success, as Beth can attest, I think. Um, yeah, and, 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 but I think that the finding, what is it that we can do to, to get our people respected? Yes, but also how do you get them? I think getting them paid at the end of the day uh, is, uh, I, I hate to be uh, sound mercenary, but I think that's, you know, we do want to, nobody gets appreciated enough. Nobody ever gets paid enough, but we can do better. Yeah, and I think that, that's why that's why goal seven attracts attracted my interest. Right. One of the points that I wanted to make in in that long kind of response, Celia, is it's not the narrative. The facts are the facts. The data is the data. Our economy, like many others, has been in decline for decades. If we don't do something different, we're going to keep getting what we've always gotten. So, so then it's, it goes back to the narrative. So Katie, we're talking about a couple of communities um, that, that are by you that, that have shifted, right? And, and I know um, so some of the work that Chad's doing um, talks about that. It's, it's, there's somebody, somebody gets that message, right? Somebody um, hears about something and it resonates with them and they're in a position of power that they can influence or fund a position. So now like Dia, who's, who's one of our newer eShip champions, she is the entrepreneur specialist for the Asia ADA Jobs Foundation. So hers is a traditional economic development thing in a very small community in rural Oklahoma. And somebody in that community said, hey, we need somebody who thinks about entrepreneurship, because that's the buzzword, enough that they create a position that she, so that's what she does, right? So, so how do you, is it, I know we talk about universal support being intertwined with a lot of this and the storytelling. So Katie, who were those champions? So what happened is you, you almost, this is my opinion, um, you have to sneak up on them because we didn't go to the economic development director in, in Apex and say, hey, we need to start thinking about entrepreneurship. We went to her with the project that um, that some community, other community people wanted to do. And we said, this is we'll be focusing on small business and we'd love to have the town support. And she got involved and saw the impact. So three cohorts in to, after three classes of launch Apex, now she's looking at that and she's seeing these businesses coming on board and getting the support they would traditionally not get. Um, and that's when she looked at it and said, Hey, we gotta, we can't just go hunting elephants all the time. We got to grow some grass. Um, so we have another town Carrie, that had put a small business liaison in place, but still isn't quite sure exactly what he's supposed to be calling be doing. And we're helping them to try to define that. So I don't think you can go to it with the hard sell because we don't have a track record, but we can show them and we can get them involved in projects that allow them to see something firsthand. I think that's what happened with social media and with marketing and project management. They all saw that there were specific, there was, there were specific skills needed to be successful in it. And you need, it was an important part of the overall mix. And that's when um, the profession started developing. Does that make sense? No, yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, it's, it goes alongside Annika's um, Annika and Jess Edwards project about unsung heroes. Um, but I wonder if we, we just start like a, a Twitter, Facebook campaign that says, who's the entrepreneurial ecosystem builder in your community, right? And, and start collecting names and, and find out about people. And, and, and then everybody's like, oh, do we have one in our community? Who is that? Um, 
and maybe it's it's just one of those things that that um, gets spread far and wide and it becomes sexy, right? That too, but I, my question is, are we sitting over here in our silo looking at them saying, why don't they get it? Why don't they come over here and get in our silo instead of going to them saying, here's a project that we're working on that might be a good fit for you. Would you like to be involved? I mean, I think we have to do more than, it's more than one yeah. strategy. But yeah. I think we, we have to reach out and say, can we come up, how would you like to be involved in this? This can help you reach your objectives of, of building business. We know you're hunting elephants over there, but, and this is not going to take all your time, but come on and be a part of this. And think, we can uh, also at the same time be building up the, doing the, um, uh, going for the mindset with a lot of the um, communication and visibility. I think in some communities, even in some communities where um, there are recognized ecosystem builders, I think traditional economic development still views those individuals as just, in a sense, the, the PR campaign for their efforts around the traditional stuff that they're doing, that they're the ecosystem builders and startup space is pretty much just creating the buzz or the environment that leads to the traditional economic stuff that they're doing, that they're still not, even though it may exist in some communities, it's still not recognized as leading um, to what traditional economic development is trying to achieve. And so it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing, right? Um, so in Holly Springs, um, they already had a person kind of allocated to small business, but not really, you know, but we got them involved in the Launch Holly Springs project. And finally, after three classes, the team went back and they did a survey of all the participants and they were able to go to economic development and say, this is how many people came to the program. This is how many have opened up a brick and mortar store shop. Here are the number of people that have gotten out of their bonus rooms into some type of physical space of paying rent as a business owner. Here are the number of people that have hired somebody or plan to hire somebody in the next 12 months. So now that, you know, they're seeing this, uh, measurements that we're feeding back to them, we're get we're seeing them. That team got a a ten thousand dollar grant from their downtown development organization, which was usually focused on trying to bring in big companies that's going to build big buildings. So, I think it's a chicken and an egg thing. We have to keep feeding and chipping away and eroding by sh by proving what we're saying. I don't think they could just suddenly get it, you know. But the, so the, I remember at the first eShip Summit, it was, there was a lot of talk around, this is economic development, this is entrepreneurial ecosystem building, and, and this is the new, and this is the old, and so we need to like do away with, or whatever, and evolve and push the new. Now we talk about ecosystem building being the evolution of economic development. So economic development is the thing that came before and ecosystem building is the way that, that this is progressing so that it's not an us against them kind of thing. And so having Del Gines speak, you know, a member of the EDC that comes and talks about, um, economic entrepreneurial ecosystem building as as this is what we're doing and this is how it's evolved i think is a very important conversation because otherwise we we tend to um we tend to come up against a lot of friction then the more that we say that it's not then the more pushback we get right so so it's it's maybe um that kind of discussion. So Chad, I'm, I'm curious about um, the stuff that, that you work on and you, because you're identifying the communities all around Australia that are, there's momentum around. And, and are you seeing this or are you seeing that it's, it's kind of merging? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. And um, a lot of the comments that have been made are, are absolutely spot on as far as the approach. Uh, it, it is a long play. One of the questions I ask when I go under region is who owns 
the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Of course, there's an immediate reaction. Nobody owns it. It's all of us. The issue being that if it's all of us and it's none of us, there's no accountability. Or the, the major entity in the room, the big tree that blocks out all the other sunlight says, well, it's us. But then if it's that tree, then nothing else can really grow and we don't get the, the weird and wonderful. Um, so the successful models I am seeing is a, a, an EDO, some sort of economic development organization that acts as a specialist function. As we see this evolution, like what we're describing here, um, it, it's almost like we see it, but we're like, it just has to run its course. And I'm taking notes as we talk about different examples. HR with high performance work systems and different coaching frameworks and being more inclusive about people, the environment and this whole movement towards corporate social responsibility that we saw marketing and the whole inclusion of social media. And it's a conversation quality and this whole notion of total quality management and ISO 9000 project management and the movement towards agile. And all the time we've seen these, you see a new form pop up over here. You get the us versus them the incumbents and establishment do some margy bargy. This gets legitimized as a new form. It's, a, it's an outsourced model with potentially higher value and so we're, we're paid. And then eventually it moves inside. And as Hassan was describing, we start seeing these new roles form internally and pretty soon this thing that we are on the outside just becomes part of the institution until a new form comes up. And so I think we are seeing that. We're seeing over here in Australia, at least we're seeing local governments employing people as ecosystem builders. Um, I, I am going for a role as a research fellow uh, innovation ecosystems. And so it's being brought into the university institutions as a separate function. I think that's a natural evolution. But, and so we're, what we need to talk about is how do we best manage and facilitate this transition uh, and educate the people that are there uh, and get the case studies out there, get the, get the examples out there so we know what it looks like. So it's not A, academic, and B, so we can provide cases for the, for the large institutions who say, well, we do that anyways. Yeah, but here's kind of what it could look like. Do you actually do this? So it sounds like we have to also elevate the best examples of that. In Absolutely. The um, so, so that's why eShip Champions leadership development, all of those things are, are very integral to it. And then it's, it's the ripple out effect, right? So we model what's needed to create what's possible. And then we, we keep infusing that. And, um, and I think, you know, Katie and Beth for sure have come up. It's, it's this, um, a, a lot of whittling away and then, here, here's what it could look like, right? Here's, here's what we're trying for. This is, here's some examples. And, and I think Norris's work on, on trying to quantify, qualify all of that information. And then you get the storytellers, um, Annika, Jess, you know, Jeff, all of them. And so it is interdependent on all of us doing all these things together in order to move the field forward. Um, so not one thing, but, um, but all of the things. So, so Katie, when, because I know you've had um, conversations with Rick Smyer, who <laughs> some of us have been on a call with, and Hassan and I spent a couple of days with him last week. Um, and he's all about this complex systems and, and interdependencies and the whole idea of a master capacity builder is really seeing all that, that, um, what is it? Um, somebody said, it's like the mycelium and you don't necessarily, you know, it's kind of there, but, um, but it's, it's kind of invisible, but we need to, to make sure that that's, doing so I'm curious on because uh, there's a lot of stuff that they want to do and and he's in your backyard and to think about the future of what that can look like um, yeah. so I think my biggest concern about uh, when we start talking about and you know we had the future forward college initiative here at Wake Tech for several years that Rick was a consultant for I'm not sure how far we got because it seems like we just stayed up in the clouds all the time 
talking about the possibility and looking way out in the horizon and how wonderful it's going to be. Look at the beautiful sunset and look at the color. And we had trouble getting it down to, okay, that's wonderful, but what's the next step? Where do we put our foot next? And I think our biggest challenge is this has to make sense for people who are not living this stuff every day. And they don't have to be um, raving fans and, and evangelists and ambassadors in order to understand and accept it, if we can make it make sense to them regarding where they put their foot next. And I think that's our biggest challenge is bringing it down to some type of really practical form and say, hey, you know what? This can help right now today. Just put your foot right here. I like that. That makes sense. That's uh, because you can't see what's past that, right? Right. And, and how long, by the time we get everybody to, to understand what's up there above the clouds, the clouds will have moved. So everybody doesn't have to understand what's up there. All they have to do is see how it benefits them today. Right. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting notion. Um, so I have this project that I'm doing on the side that, um, that requires um, people to collaborate. And I said, I cannot promise you fame and fortune. I'm hoping for fame or fortune. Mm -hmm. um, and what I really need you to figure out is, because I cannot define it for you, what is the win for you in being involved in this project? Because if there's not a win for you and you're doing it purely in service of this project or what seems good, it's something else is going to come along that's more lucrative, more interesting, sexier, and your energy is going to go that way. And I'm, there's no blame or shame in that. Mm -hmm. But if, unless you have a vested interest in the things that are happening, then I can't expect but for you to go away eventually. So that's not, that's not healthy. So I think that it's not ecosystem building as Brad Feld talks about give before you get. And, and any of you have read the article that I wrote on medium. I don't necessarily believe that um, fully. I like coming with a sharing mindset because I think that, um, that sometimes you don't know what you can give. Sometimes you don't know what you have. Um, sometimes you're just new and you don't have anything to share um, or whatever. I mean, maybe you're resource poor. So, um, so we, it, it takes a lot of privilege to think about giving before you get. And I don't know yeah. that it's wholly totally healthy. Yes, yeah, so, so, so we've had this, this conversation and, and, and I do agree. Um, one of the challenges I've seen, we see with collective impact models is we do invite everyone around the table and, you know, to, to Katie's point, we talk about being ecosystem builders, and it's great to build the ecosystem and let's do collective impact. And, and, and through all of that, we're not actually doing anything. And so all we do is attract the kind of people that want to talk about this kind of stuff, which is often government or university and people on a salary, and they get paid to be around the table. And the people that are actually getting things done and have a vested interest in something else, they leave. Uh, and quite often, I feel is what we're asking people to do when they come around the table is to do the work of government for government because government's the only one with the vested interest in the long-term mass of the land. Everyone else who comes around, the corporates after profit, the entrepreneurs after survival, um, you know, they're, they're just, and, and so, and even based on our conversation, Cecilia, it really just reinforced that notion of please come with your agenda. Don't leave it behind. Let us know exactly what you want to get out of this. And so we can actually co-create this thing we're creating. So you get something out of it. And then people will say, yeah, but how can they get a benefit? because well, they're putting in and you get out what you put in. Definitely um, this, this ethos of giving first, which I think is just more of a, a, a cultural and spiritual undertone as much as it is a, a privileged position of, I got a bunch of money so I can give it away first. So I think absolutely agree with that. How do we invite people to the table and say, um, and I like the, what the Katie's analogy as far as, you don't even know what's with the clouds. It's gonna rain next week, Tuesday, three o'clock. Get ready for it. Tell us what you want out of the rain. And by the way, when it rains, who else can you help as you're taking a bit in? 
I like I like that uh, Chad the ability to if people are willing to not game the system that they're coming in I there was the last time we had something like that here the pe some people came in and because we had an opportunity some major funding and people came in and then tried to hijack the funding for their own purposes and kind of screw the whole thing up which turned out to be a benefit because you know they sort of outed themselves but to the degree that you can be that you know, position yourself as, as as open and as the as the fair broker, uh, sitting there watching a con a, a panel where the head of the new Idaho Women's Business Center is talking to one of the leaders of the tech community who pegs the meter on misogyny. Literal, I mean, it's it's like in this day and age, even Idaho is very frightening, and he played him like a fiddle is better than I am, obviously better than I am, but figuring out how to, is there other ways so we can incentivize people not to, not to game the system, but actually come in and say, say, yeah, we'll, we'll play fair. Uh, does that mean we need to give them a small win early? Uh, what seems to be working out there? Those are all great points. Thank you. Thank you for, for, summarizing quantifying um i i want to introduce part of goal one to the conversation in um inviting people to the table um we always have to remember that sometimes maybe we, what we need to do is build a table because the tables that already exist aren't necessarily welcoming or the idea of how do you invite people um well to a table that hasn't historically seated <clears throat> certain demographics. That's also challenging and interesting and, and the interdependencies on that. Um, so so that's a that's an, a very interesting notion. I think one one of the things that um, that this group in particular is um, is really in a, in a great environment to do, as I mentioned on the other call, is is um, how do you welcome people to this table that we've set and prepared, right? So we put together a framework that um, that to to use for the goals and and so what does that look like? So in in the last couple of minutes. Um, I want to I want to talk about so we talked about the challenges we talked about what sustainable work work looks like and some of the things that that needs to happen to change that. What is the one what like Norris's um, question? Um, what is the big one wild thing that um, that you would like to see happen to create sustainable work? What's your what's what? To say the question that you like to ask, Norris, what's your wild um, ask? Is that, the, is that, am I framing it well? Well, I, I'm all for, oh, wait, I think, I'm all for a big, hairy, audacious goals. And okay. there's, uh, there's, there's, but there, you know, the bee hog, bee hag, but there's also the bee hog, big, hairy, audacious, worthy goals. So uh, to qualify that, it, you know, it's the old, if you could wave a magic wand, you know, Harry Potter's wand and make something happen, uh, what would you like to see in your community? What is that one thing, one, that one thing, small or large, that would be the, the leverage point to, to move things forward? All right. That's a great wrap question. So go ahead, Norris. What's the big, hairy, audacious, worthy goal that you would like to see in your community? I'm sorely tempted to say, somebody please take me seriously. Uh, but uh, that the, the people in, in, high, in, in really high places stop looking at job titles and, and figuring out who the power players are and actually look at the people who are getting stuff done. The, the, the real, you know, when someone steals credit for somebody's idea that they get called out on it by the powers that be. And that's just, you know, educating, and it may not take, a, might, it might not take a lot to educate the governor, the mayor, and such on that. You want to call everyone, 
everyone's staring at me like I, I, I either said something brilliant or something really totally confusing. So okay, so so pick, <laughs> pick somebody to answer that question. Norris. What I'm sorry. Pick somebody. Oh. I, oh, oh. <laughs> um. We haven't let Beth talk in a while. Beth. Hey, thanks. It's awesome listening to you guys. Um, I think my big goal, wild, wild fantasy, is that we simplify things and somehow convince, and maybe something is already happening around that, we convince the governing bodies around economic development that this is a key thing to integrate into every economic development strategy and that we conduct a huge we get to the place where we can conduct this huge global awareness campaign to educate everyone as to why entrepreneurial development, entrepreneurship is key to economic transformation. And then everybody knows and the work is sustainable. That's my fantasy. And I will go to Katie. So I have a very simple, simple fantasy. Um, and that is, I would like us, I would like to see a boil down job description of an entrepreneurial ecosystem builder. So, so that we can show people what this person looks like, what they do, the impact they could have, and how it might fit into their overall scheme that currently exists in economic development. That will be my dream. Okay. Is it that one of the initiatives under one of the goals to come up with a job description? Actually, it is. And maybe that well noted, Norris, maybe um, that's something that we can tackle in the next call. Yeah, is I think that's, 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 that's the group's goal, right? <laughs> okay, so we're going to make Katie's dream come true. Um, yeah. Norris, I need you to add to write down what it is on your on the agenda, what you just summarized, because I can't seem to quantify it. Um, Chad, what is your big, hairy, audacious, worthy goal? Um, sure, thanks for that. A lot of really good goals out there. Mine's pretty simple. Um, I just want a, a monthly example on what success looks like in a webinar to follow it up. So uh, we, we can talk about kind of what this looks like, needing to convince people just very practically every single month want to see a different case study, a, a different region of somebody doing exceptionally well. And that explains it at the appropriate level. You know, not necessarily the person running the accelerator, the innovation hub, and helping this one entrepreneur, but who's brought the actual system together at the meta level. Uh, and so just a, a monthly case study and a get together of people to come and actually learn from that case study. If we can achieve that, that would be fantastic. Is that um, a good framework for the next couple of months of agenda for this call? Um, yeah, and, it, and, and heading into the e-ship, if we can come with a, a cadence of success on what it looks like, um, I, th I think that would be fun. And potentially even then also having some position descriptions to support that work, as, as Katie and Beth's pretty passionate about that as well. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, Norris on the agenda, on the um, the running agenda on goal seven. Um, will you put your your response to that um, down there? And so it sounds like for the month of February, we should put together um, a job description, and then maybe we can talk about um, um, what Chad talked about as a monthly report of what success looks like and what um hang on i wrote support but it's success um so that's a what well, that's a that's a good couple of months think about some people that are doing stuff in community that would be good speakers for march april and may um and um and we'll jot those down um for me i think um well i know one of what 
um, one of the things that I want to work on as far as sustainable work is, is some kind of um, leadership development model. So you are all um, like uh, parts of that experiment, right? So, so how do we create more field leadership? Um, so spoiler alert, there will be a newsletter coming out this week um, from the foundation talking about the leadership skills uh, around ecosystem builders. And let's see if we can come up with um, how, to, how to develop that into um, training, certification, you know, what, what does that look like? And Katie, um, I will be having a discussion with Rick Smyer actually on what that is so that we can um, maybe bring master capacity building to a more tangible next steps model and, and then use the ecosystem building development um, to push forward and, and also incorporate that future view. So in my mind and my hope is that there's a, an intermingling of both of those competencies. Does that make sense? So, so it's not so meta and it's also not so like, oh, it's, it's what we do like right this minute kind of thing. So, all right. Thank you all for your time and energy. Chad, have a wonderful rest of your full day. Um, that started at four o'clock in the morning with some of us. And, um, and we will look forward to talking to all of you um, in the next little bit. So, thank you. All right, take care.